Allow me to reintroduce myself. Now tuned into the greatest. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. And it's your host, Supreme Decisions. Well, I've actually been going back and I've been reviewing Supreme a lot of the track. stuff that I've been talking about. And I've looked at the aspects of the things that I'm teaching. And I actually want to give a quick shout out to the subscriber, actually one of the new subscribers, that's a teacher. And they gave me a very good vote of confidence when they spoke about the curriculum that I'm giving is one that should be taught in as early as high school. Because other than the vulgarity that I have whenever I'm speaking on most occasions, the information that's being, you know, transcribed or even broadcast to you is actually on point. While there are certain aspects that I'm leaving out, I'm giving it to you in increments to where it can be understood. So the reason I'm going to accept that as the vote of confidence or whatever, or the attaboy, is because It's just amazing to me how many times I have opposition from people that, one, don't do what I do, haven't practiced as I've practiced, and for the most part, can't see beyond themselves. And they're telling me the things that I'm doing is incorrect, but they don't understand or have an idea of how to correct it. So... When someone tells me that I don't know what I'm doing and then I have someone that has been doing what I'm doing as far as teaching for more than 50 years and they're saying, dude, I love you. You're doing the right things other than the language, which I can appreciate because that is actually one thing that I'm going to work on Um, because most part my vernacular is I speak with a lot of profanity while... I should be able to, you know, come up with better verbiage to express myself. I don't. But again, it's one of those things in choice. But it's one of those things that kind of lead me into today. Because it's also one of the things that I don't talk about. And I should because I look at us as the ones that, okay, you know what, I'm going to fight. But I also... Forget about those that do opt to have someone represent their interests. And in doing so, even a public defender has an obligation. Because just like the title of today's podcast suggests, everyone is entitled to a vigorous defense. And today, the long and short is going to be detail-oriented, probably a little more than necessary or even more than I should but it's going to be something that not only captivates it kind of resonates with your soul because I want to give you something that's not only available but I'm going to give you something because I often tell you you can't argue with yourself you can't argue with you well when we're looking at some of the things that I do I often kind of deflect or even take from the federal um, statutes and codes and even with the um, Supreme Court decisions, I kind of leave those. And I talk about the state organic codes or the state codes of criminal procedure. And in some cases, the state's code of civil procedure. But what happens is I think a lot of that gets lost Because just like whenever I spoke about filing several motions now here in Texas, where I spoke about the district attorney or district attorneys, their subordinates, and their actual job is to make sure everyone has discovery. I even spoke about Sudlow and Sudlow, Miss Ann, who stated that discovery is discretionary. And how when I gave her the Texas Code, which is, I believe, is... Texas 38.14 where it states that it has to be done immediately and I often speak about what needs to be done in your process or in your order and one of that is the entry of appearance why because 
that actually ignites or sets off the immediateness. Because once they know where to send discovery, they don't have an option to not send it. But then I also speak about being detailed in what you're asking for. From even the location, even time on video, time on audio, communications done through that. But what I don't speak about is what if you're not doing that? What if you're not the one asking? What is it that you should expect from the person that is representing your interests? Because the American Bar Association, criminal justice standards for the defense function. This is actually something that I ran across because it is a teaching manual. Yes, I said it. It is a teaching manual. The American Bar Association. When I speak about those that have a bar card, this is where their card is quote-unquote registered to. This is where their dues go to. This is their regulating body. These are the ones that have the determinant factor in all things bar card members. I guess that's the easiest way to put that. So if it has to do with a bar card member, this is where it's done at and this is how it's done. And they have one requirement because I actually appreciate that because I tell you guys, most of the stuff that you have or that I give you is actually free. When you go to the Harvard Law Review's website, which churns out, Harvard Law, churns out the best or highest rated attorneys in the country. They are pretty much the most successful at it. They are pretty much, let's, say, let's call them the Michael Jordans of law. Why? Because the way they are taught is the detail that is engulfed them within how they attack, which allows them to be as successful as pretty much anyone on the planet. Now, there are other law, law schools that you can go to that also churn out successful. But when you're looking at certain things, just like I spoke about Miles Clark, whenever he was teaching me how to play basketball, teaching me how to be competitive, and teaching me how to be serious, he asked me one question. He said, do you want to be a good player where you can have a decent career, or do you want to be a great player? And, of course, I was like, I want to be great. He said, well, you need to study the greats. You need to practice like the greats. You also need to understand and be great. Because you have to go above and beyond in order to be prepared. You have to be willing to study tape. And you have to be willing to do what the unsuccessful aren't willing to do because here's the separation the reason I don't speak of others representing me because that's not not something I ever do I don't allow anybody else to speak for me I'm pretty much decided that I'm a grown person and I'm able to have a voice that can and will be heard now do I expect to be correct all the time I would love that I would love that luxury of being right all the time The problem is I've been married, so I know I've done that wrong. I've been wrong. And as um, Sex Entertainer stated, I am fallible. I understand that. I get it. But that's why I also appreciate people whenever they give me these comments and give me the feedback of, you know what? I think that's a little bit incorrect because I'm actually going to give you a case that was given to me by someone in the comment section. Because it's one of those where, again... I give you bits and pieces, but I often tell you that I'm giving you those things that I use the most often and that they're pretty much the most, the precedence, because just like when I speak about Roe v. Wade, it happened, but it was about the choice to do with your body. Now, what most people forget is Bolton v. Georgia happened the exact same day. And that is the case that actually set up the standards for abortion. This is why whenever a lot of people went out and did certain things, they didn't understand. They wanted to have a conversation with me and want to tell me I was wrong about what I was looking at. But 
why have the conversation when there is a separate case that actually determines something? Because even in this instance, what the case I'm going to talk about deals with a case that happened prior to Terry v. Ohio. But it was the it was a groundbreaking case. It was the ground setting case. It was a case that set a precedent. Terry v. Ohio gave you details on procedures. I speak about procedures, but to give you context, I'm going to give you this other case. But this is the type of stuff that I enjoy. This is the type of things that I need. Because it allows iron to sharpen iron, but it also allows me to make sure that there is no child left behind. Because all of us that are still seeking knowledge and looking to be molded, we are childlike in our mindsets. Because a child can be molded. As long as you're not grown, you have an opportunity to grow. And I like to think of all of us as a child in the aspects of learning. Because at no time can I tell you I know everything. Even in the field that I excel in, when it comes to criminal procedures, I know there's someone that knows it just a little bit better than I do. But that's why I keep moving forward. That's why I look at old cases and then I go, ah, oh, where did I get that from? Why did I say that right there? And then I go back and I review and then I'll stumble upon another case. And I keep reading every month the new cases that come out from the Supreme Court. I look at decisions that come forth. Why? Because I allow iron to sharpen iron. And I also allow myself to continue to make sure I'm not giving you trash. I want to make sure you have substance every time I speak. I want to make sure when I hit the door that this is something that fills your belly. And I appreciate the American Bar Association because they give out a free teaching manual. And the only thing they ask in return is that this work may be used for nonprofit educational and training purposes and legal reform. Now, give you context. My channel is not a nonprofit. So we can go ahead and skip over that. It is for training purposes. And it is also for legal reform. So those things allow me to use this, this text. It allows me to speak on this text. It allows us to grow from this text and it allows us to benefit from understanding this text because anyone that has a bar card they have to abide by the pause for dramatic effect this text because these are their rules these are where they pledge their allegiance to and the greatest part about this, it is stated, they go on to state, without written permission, but with a citation of the source. And the source, again, is the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Standards for the Defense Function, 4th edition, 2017. So no, I don't have old material that I'm about to speak to you on. This is something that's current, new, and heavy. This is the steak and potatoes. Because when you're looking at this, I'm looking right now at probably nine to ten chapters. And the great part about this is the fact that you ain't got nowhere to go. But you decided to grace me by listening. And I appreciate that. Because when it starts off, it starts off with just general standards. And the defense counsel means any attorney, including privately retained, assigned by the court. Now, I'm going I'm to I'm stop right there real quick. Because privately retained is that person that you go out and say, here, here's the XYZ dollars to represent me in court. That's privately retained. And they have a bar card. Keep that in mind. 
The second one is assigned by the court. This would be someone working pro bono, which I don't do, nor am I a bar card member, or a public defender. Now, before I go deeper into that, one of the things that you're going to hear or you're going to understand is at some point I'm going to give you context on each one of these aspects. And in the context of each one of these aspects, I'm going to speak about each matter requires. And I think most of us understand the words require. We understand the definition of requirement. And each requirement for a case deals with 100 man hours on that case. Now, a regular work week, that would entail to 40 hours. So 40 plus 40, then you have 20 left over. So that's going to leave you in the middle of Wednesday. So you have two full work weeks and a half. You get a half day. That is required for each case. The problem is, because the system is designed for revenue generation, no public defender has that amount of time to work on any one case. Even if it's a case that goes to trial, which makes it even worse. Because they are not there to be adversaries for the most part. They're there to be negotiators. They're there to lose. So if you're, when I actually did the video and I used um, the Lincoln lawyer and Matthew McConaughey where he spoke about you either pay me or use a public defender. The problem is people will choose not to pay me and don't understand how to use a public defender. I'm going to say that one more time. They choose not to pay me and don't understand how to use a public defender. Why? Because they don't know the duties of a public defender. Because, again, these are just the general standards and scope and function of these standards. And whether it's someone that's privately retained or signed by the court or someone acting pro bono, or servicing indigent defendants in legal aid or public defender's office. It will be anyone who acts as an attorney on behalf of a client being investigated or prosecuted for alleged criminal conduct. A client seeking legal advice regarding a potential ongoing or past criminal matter. A subpoena, including as a witness. Because most people don't understand because there was even a young lady that was involved in my trial. She was um, arrested or brought in on a material witness warrant. They scared her so bad she took a deal. And she wasn't even one of the people that was being charged. She just took a charge. you know. But again, it was because fear took over instead of actual the ability to think, listen, and then respond. Because again, don't understand the procedures. Of what needs to be done. Did not have the confidence. In what needed to be done. Because when I talk about. It is difficult to look the devil in the eye. And still have that same attitude. Still have that same flair. It is. It is the scariest thing ever. When someone else decides. For you. What your life is going to be. The scariest thing is. Understanding how little control you actually do have. And these are ways that we can, while not gaining full control, we can actually steer the ship and allow us to say, hey, you know what, if I go down, I went down fighting. And the only way they can beat me is if they take it from me. And you have to make them take it. But you have to keep fighting. As long as there's breath in your lungs, you need to be fighting. That is the only that is the only thing that I would actually require of anyone. If you're thinking about calling me, if you're thinking about asking me for help or direction, understand each and every case I'm going to tell you to fight because you're still breathing. 
because there are many people that aren't here that wish they could fight, wish they would have fought, or wish they were in a position to fight. You're in that position. You take a stand, bite down on your mouthpiece, and start swinging. But understand, it's still getting the understanding of what they can and can't do. Because the standards are intended to serve the best interests of the client. I'm going to say that one more time. The standards are intended to serve the best interests of the client and should not be relied upon to justify any decision that is counter to the client's best interests. And it should not be relied upon to justify any decision that is counter to the client's best interests. The burden to justify any exception should rest with the lawyer seeking it. Because they have a standard of care. They have a duty of care. Once they are assigned to you or you pay them. Because now they are an employee. They are your mouthpiece. They are your representative. They are you. Do you get yourself in a position where you don't speak when your life is on the line? Your liberty is on the line. Hell, your pocketbook is on the line. These are the things that we need to get better understood and better handles on. And these standards are intended to provide guidance for the, uh, guidance for the professional conduct and performance of defense counsel. They are not intended to modify a defense attorney's obligations under applicable rules, statutes, or the Constitution. Now, when you're talking about the rules and statutes or the Constitution, they're in a position of customer service. I'm going to say that one more time. They're in a position of customer service service yes those S's are going to be real hard on your speakers but I got you I got you I'm going to try to dull them down a little bit but what I want you to understand is you're the one in charge I've given you the case on that I've given you multiple cases on you being in charge they are there for your benefit again this is not my words this is actually written in their bylaws their guidelines their rules, their instructions. Those are not my words. But there'll be people say, oh, that's your opinion. No, I'm I'm literally reading this from the American Bar Association teaching guy. So if you have a bar card, these are your instructions. Don't have to put any opinion in it. Because it doesn't matter how I feel either way about it. That's the one great thing about the truth. When it's given, nobody cares about who's telling it. Because the one thing I love about it is, oh, well, he's a criminal. Absolutely. Never refuted it. However, comma, doesn't change the information. I can be whatever it is that you need me to be for you to sleep easy at night. But it doesn't change the information doesn't change my walk of life doesn't change any of that these are the things that I want to get across these are the things that I want to make sure they're completely understood because the biggest thing is when they're talking about these standards the standards are intended to address the performance of criminal defense counsel in all stages of their professional work Other ABA criminal justice standards should also be consulted for more detailed consideration of the performance of criminal defense defense counsel in specific areas. Because, you remember, I talk about things such as arraignment. I've talked about bond. I've talked about why you would be refused bond. I talked about preliminary hearings. I talk about arraignments. I've talked about wadir. I've talked about the actual trial. I've talked about map hearings. 
I've spoken about weight hearings. I've talked about challenging evidence. I've talked about police reports. See, all of these things are the guidelines for a great defense attorney because they are pains in the ass because they can actually make a difference because just by asking for something and being specific about it it doesn't allow for a lot of worming around I'm not going on a fishing expedition I'm actually going out here with a hard prune I'm not casting mine I'm shooting I'm not going out with the Uzi. I'm going out with a sniper rifle. One shot, one kill. By doing that, you're making your duties easier. That is the reason why defense attorneys are so expensive. Because they do the things that most other people will not do, cannot do, and choose not to do. Because they're choosing not to get along. They're choosing to be adversaries. They're choosing to be different. And at the same time, they're still swimming with the other piranha. Y'all don't hear me. Y'all gonna make me you're gonna make me have church in here today. But I want you to understand they're still swimming with the other piranha. This is not one of the tactics of the weak. This is something that is very detailed. And understanding the standard functions and duties of defense counsel are the things that make them who they are, that allow you to be greater at times that you don't think you may. Can. Hell, you may not believe that you can be great at that time, but this allows you to be there. Because defense counsel is essentially the administration to the criminal justice. I'm going to say that one more time. They're an administrator. Who does that sound like? Does that sound like administrative assistant? Who would that be? A secretary. Why? Because you're the boss. You have to direct them. As long as you're allowing them to run ruck shop, You are losing. You have to take the horse by the reins. You have to be willing to look the devil in the eye. Sometimes that devil is on your team. This is what I speak about when I say enemy of my enemy. (laughs) enemy. The enemy of my enemy is not my friend. They are just a tool I use to defeat them both. Because I understand who my true enemy is. Understand that. I understand who the real enemy is. I understand going into something, what it is I'm looking for out of it. And in a lot of cases, you know what? Let me, because you know I like to tell you guys stories. Let me give you something. I used to sell Kirby vacuums, and back in the day, one of the things that was a requirement was we had to take an hour. Uh, Out of every day, out of every morning. Most time it was while we were eating. And we had to listen to either Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, um, Tony Robbins, Les Brown. We had to listen to somebody that was giving us knowledge. Not necessarily motivation, but giving us something. And Zig Ziglar spoke about no one cared how much you knew until they knew how much you cared. And I didn't get it. I didn't get it. But it's understanding. Do I care about me? That's a question that you need to ask each and every time when you're standing there. Do you care? Because even in my trial, my grandmother pleaded with me. Baby, get a lawyer. Baby, get a lawyer. Baby, get a lawyer. And I said, Measy, I love you. But don't nobody love me more than I love me. Nobody's going to fight for me harder than I'm going to fight for me. I found a purpose in that fight. But at the same time, 
it was one of those things where I had so little control. I wanted to take harness of the things that I actually could control. I can control filing a document. I can control me sitting up at night making sure I can actually speak, I guess, fluently on this document. Making sure that I can actually draw my picture with this document. And even going through that, I actually figured out some objections that I would have to. I tried to beat myself. Just understand that I had to see not only my side, but I had to see someone else's side. I had to see me as guilty. I had to see me as something that was not prepared. But I'm going to give you your first commercial break and then I'm coming back. Because at the end of the day, this is what we need. This is how we need to get there. Welcome back, everybody, and I hope you're enjoying it thus far. Because even with this, I want to—I want you to understand something. I want to make sure that everything that we're doing is not a, not only above bar, but actually something again that has some substance, has something that you can grow on, and it also gives me a starting point. Because I've often thought about when I started, because even like with Brian Tracy used to always tell us, begin with the end in mind. Tony Robbins spoke about that in um, Awakening the Giant Within. You have to begin having an idea what the end is because it gives you something, it gives you purpose. Whenever I looked at my case in the RICO, I looked at my young son. I looked at the fact that they were trying to take me from him. And how attached he and I was. And the the flip side to that was the fact that I wasn't just going to give that to you. I couldn't give it away. And that's why whenever they, one, the deals were ridiculous that they offered us. Like, there was no thought in them. It was just the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. But... No, well, actually, for the most part, none of none of the deals that was offered to me were tangible. And yes, I did consider taking one. I considered it. Because, again, I looked at my desire for gain at one point was lower than my fear of loss. Because most of it was false expectations of being real anyway. And it was because at the second second point of that is I didn't exactly know what the actual defense counsel could do for me or should do. I knew what I would do. And unfortunately, I've been teaching you guys in that manner this entire time. So I have to give you another side of it. And understanding that the defense counsel is an administrator your administrator and the court properly constituted to hear a criminal case should be viewed as an entity consisting of the court including the judge jury and other court personnel counsel for the prosecution and counsel for defense here's the here's the thing here's the conundrum because you're going to hear something I've only said it maybe once or twice, and I think I've done it in interviews and not necessarily taught on it. But a defense counsel have a difficult task of serving both as officers of the court, because you remember I told you, piranha don't eat piranha. All of them have a bar card, so all of them are swimming in the same lake. And loyal and zealous advocates for their clients. Now, you don't have loyal, oil, or zealous advocates for you if you use the public defender because they are not on your team at all because as far as they're concerned you're guilty and you need to pay this money or go to jail that's it because they haven't met an innocent person they haven't met somebody that the system wasn't screwing over because again that's what the system is designed to do 
if you're not going to be an ad- adversary. Because that's why adversarial system. Because the system is built for combat. It's built for war. And the problem is most of us are trained not to be soldiers. And the one thing the one thing I hate is understanding that defense counsel is the client's professional representative. But when you look at that, how often do you actually see that? Because defense counsel should act zealously within the bounds of law and standards on behalf of their clients. But have no duty to and may not execute any directive of the client which violates the law or such standards in representing a client, defense counsel may engage in a good faith challenge the validity of such laws and standards if done openly. Here's the problem. I have walked into courtrooms too often and asked a simple question. Hell, I've been here in Houston probably since March. And I've worked on maybe seven cases. All, well, six of the seven are traffic violations. One is actually a weapons charge, and actually, yeah, one more. One is a drug charge. Now, the funniest thing about that is three of the cases are scheduled for trial next week. Ready for the tea? I've asked for discovery on each one of these files. All of them are in Harris County. And the funniest thing is, a week before trial, nobody has discovery. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in my life. So when I submitted my form, the DA actually contacted me directly. Now keep in mind, they came from my email with the with someone else's name on them. DA actually decided to contact me. And in doing that, they spoke. she spoke about the standard of care. She also spoke about the duties of the defense counsel. And how her county is only dealing with evidence-based justice. And no defense counsel to that point had requested discovery. Now, anybody knows one of the things I talk about. I did a video that says, do this first. Ever involved in a legal issue? Do this first. The absolute first thing. And you always hear me say, answer everything. They, I don't care what it is, they send you to answer it. But the first thing which is actually one of the easier things. Request discovery. This is something I'm giving the layman. Someone trained to do this is actually not doing this. But they're charging you money. I'm going to say that one more time. The layman. The layman is being informed to do this because this is what they need to do. Someone trained in doing so is not doing this. But they're required to do this. Why? Because they're your administrator. Now, here's the tee from that. Because I got to give it to you. Because at the end of the day, there's a certain thing that we have a kind of control over, but we don't want to exercise it. Because we feel that everyone that we speak to that we feel knows more than us, has more authority than us. And that's kind of true, but in 
not so much because if everyone in the courtroom is working towards the benefit of the public and you are the public and the person that's representing your interests, it's not higher than the interest that you have of your own self or it shouldn't be. But these are, again, standards that are written by the American Bar Association. These are not my words. This is directly from their teaching pamphlet. This is directly from their guidelines. Because one of the things that I actually enjoy and actually like is the fact that I have people that are in the legal profession that are bar cart carrying members that tell me the simplicity in which I am giving this information offers not only them kind of a foresight because a lot of this is not even given to them a lot of these breakdowns are not even given to those that practice this so these are things that you know they are using to actually kind of beef themselves up because here's 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 something that i want to want to point out because again when we're talking about the defense counsel that person that works for you that is representing your interests The defense counsel should seek to reform and to approve the administrative or the administration of criminal justice. When at when inadequacies and injustices in the substantive or procedural law comes to defend counsel's attention, should counsel stimulate and support efforts for remedy against action? Now, I just said a whole bunch of stuff that meant a whole lot of nothing. Because what it actually stands for, when there is something that is being done against a client, the defense counsel is just like that. The defense counsel is the shield within the legal system. It is the kind of the crux or the pretext of holding the rest of the legal system accountable. It's one of those things where if I'm going to stand here, you got to do this the correct way. And that's what the defense counsel is for. So when those things come up, there is a buffer between you and a system that could be corrupted. That is why you have certain things where the defense counsel requires full evidence disclosure. And actually make sure that you're being convicted or acquitted on evidence that's either presented or not presented. That is the job of the defense counsel. When there is something that's said that shouldn't be said or that actually takes away from the narrative of what they're painting their picture of, these are things that should be a part of the defense um, representative's counsel and their strategy. These are the things that are most important to us, and they should be, simply because somebody else is holding your actual life in their hands. You're giving up 100% control to someone else to make decisions on your behalf. And these things even go as far as public service, bar activities, public education, community service activities, law leadership positions. A public defense organization should support such activities and the office's budget should include funding and paid release time for these activities. The problem is when you have somebody that is overworked, underpaid, and there just to lose, any enhancement of that goes away from the system that is set forth. However, they can still be held accountable because their oath should be to you, even though their first direct oath is to the court. Their loyalty is to the court. That's why I speak about piranha in a lake. That lake can be perfectly still until something other than a piranha hits that lake. Then every piranha attacks from the defense counsel to the prosecution to the judge. All of those are cogs in the machine. These are the things that are supposed to be corrected. These are the opportunities that we have when we take upon these things for our own self. When we take upon these as our responsibility to be responsible for ourselves. Part of the things of being self-sufficient. These are things that I talk about on a daily basis. Because it's now I'm being responsible for not only myself. 
I'm being responsible for my family. I'm being responsible for the activities of those that are around me that I am scoping, shaping, and also protecting. If they allow me to do these things, these are the things that I do. But a lot of times you have to understand, if we don't understand what they're supposed to do, how can we gripe about the things that they're not doing or the things that we feel should be done if we don't know what can be done? Why it's not being done. Because even in certain cases, because just like I did, I spoke about Bayard Ellis or Andrew Broderick who played Barry Ellis on Law and Order SVU season 13 and 14, where he took on a death row case. And in this one, it was actually Mike Tyson played the death row inmate. And it's something that we see more often than not. And what Bayard Ellis did was he exhausted all of the appeals efforts. He exhausted them. And in doing so, what he had to do was bring up something and go after malicious prosecution. I'm pretty sure you remember the video that I did on that. But what happened was the prosecutor was allowed to be malicious because the original defense counsel did not force them to have an evidence-based trial which allowed for the malicious prosecution which allowed for Mike Tyson or the character Mike Tyson played to be pretty much placed in prison and to be set up on death row and this is part of why we have a system of absolution but it's so imperfect because of the human error and the duty of care. The things that people are supposed to do, they're not doing. But they're requesting something due to an entitlement idea. And even in certain things as the appointment and the performance of defense counsel in death penalty cases, they also have a certain duty. Each one of those duties are supposed to be set out and explained through each step. Every form of strategy needs to be explained to the person that is being strategically set for. Because if I get you a strategy and I then don't show you how it's going to be executed and you are part of the execution, that doesn't help anyone. I don't have to give you every detail of it, but I have to give you direction. Because if I'm not offering you direction, I'm not benefiting you. Therefore, I am not working on your behalf. And those are the duties of defense counsel. Because even afterwards, even after someone represents you, even after someone has an exercise that you've exchanged money with, whether it's a consultant, whether it's an attorney, whether it's anyone that represented your interests, they have a duty of confidentiality. They have a duty to not quote unquote inform against you unless it is the part of the continuation of a crime and that's where you have these things called plausible deniability but you also have lawyer client confidentiality you also have pastor um, what did you, I believe it's parishioner pastor and parishioner confidentiality because these are things that not only transpire in jail they also happen out of jails because if there's a jailhouse informant there's also a jailhouse lawyer because those that have a conversation with this jailhouse lawyer everything that is said to this jailhouse lawyer is now confidential there is no right or even an allowance of disclosure now, when I speak about these things, we have to understand the context. Because even those that say, hey, Rich, can you help me? When you're starting to give me your story, you're starting to give me some direction. And I say, hey, tell me what's going on. You're also allowed to give me what's going on. Give me an idea. I don't need the entire story, but I do need direction. And I need you to be honest with me. Because that allows me to build a a strategy for you. This is why I tell people I don't have templates. I don't do templates because every situation 
does not even require the exact same information. Because I actually did seven discoveries on certain traffic infractions in the last two weeks. Right? The funniest thing on that is the fact that I think only two of them actually had the exact matching um, request for discovery. Because there are certain things I don't need when I'm asking for certain situations. Why? Because each one of the situations, while they're similar, they're not the same. So if I'm asked for a bunch of things, a lot of times if it's not something that's relevant, because you'll also hear me say that, but that is also part of counsel. He has to know what is and what isn't relevant. And that's where the separation comes in. That's where defending comes in. That's where strategy explodes at. Because that also offers you the direction that your case is going to go in and how you're going to build upon it and how you're going to actually be able to enforce your ideas. Because I, there was this thing we were doing a couple of days ago, because I'm going to get back on track. And a guy said, well, I'm on plan B, C, D, and E. And I told him my plan B is enforcing plan A. Because if I have to make adjustments, I can adjust, I can adapt, but I still have to go with what I set forth with my first mind. Because I've learned changing course, changing your plans, changing anything that's in there in mid-flow does not help. Adapting to what's being placed in front of you, such as water, going over, under, around, or through allows you to keep what's in front of you there and not be trying to hit a moving target. Because it's the essence of one shot, one kill. Sometimes you have to take the sacrifice to understand exactly what focus and what premise you need to be working on. Because the change of direction, because just just give you a great, great idea. Again, you know I love movies. And one of the people that we had kind of a little deal with was Will Smith, and he played Deadshot. Deadshot used the change of direction to become deadly accurate with it. Why? Because he understood the aspects of geometry and force. And understanding trajectory, he was able to become one of, if not the best shooter ever. And he didn't miss his targets. He always hit what he was aiming at. But here's the flip side to that. He hit what he was aiming at because he allowed himself to work with and be adaptive because he understood those changes were coming. So now they are pre-planned and they are part of his focus. Those redirections were purposeful, not accidents that he adapted to. They were part of the plan. That is what I'm talking about. He remained fluent as water because even moving targets, he was able to adapt his shot to what they were doing. They were still moving, but he kept his focus on what he his job was. And that is what a defense counsel is supposed to do. And through that, they're supposed to be candid because they have a duty of candor. And in that duty of candor, they have to inform you of these steps. They have a duty to communicate. They have... That's why they always tell you, you have to be able to come out and then be able to make a conscious decision on any offer that is made to you. Whether you accept it or not, you still have to know what's available to you. Because that is one of the biggest things that a lot of people are lacking in today's society. is the fact that most people don't want candor. They don't want honesty. They don't want things that are up front. They want to be told what's good and they want to feel good. And they want to have these these celebrations for nothing. They want their feelings spared and all this other crap. When in fact, that is what's needed. Direct slaps in the face. Eye openers. Not worrying about your feelings, but allowing you to be informed. We're in the information age where nobody wants information. There was a time people were starving for information. People don't want information in the information age where everything is open or all you have to do is request. And then if the request is not fulfilled, there's something else you can do to make sure that things keep pushing forward. But most people don't want to work. 
Most people want instant. Most people want the easy. And anything in life is that's easy is not for you. But it's understand. And then they have a duty of continuality. And what that does is any actions that happen after the representation. It is still set up through the stages of the defense, through the trial, through the sentencing, and even post-conviction reviews. Because a lot of times they're supposed to be at what they would consider your um, what it, parole hearings. Most are not. Because they would, con- they would consider that more money. I need more money to be sitting there and doing what I'm supposed to do. And a duty to consider collateral consequences of decisions and actions, including but not limited to the collateral consequences of conviction. These are things that you have to inform people of. They have to know that there is a chance that you could be convicted. But that falls under that duty of candor. It's giving someone an honest answer. And... Uh, here's here's the thing here's the thing because I often often tell people one of the things that you don't often hear a defense counsel say is because one you can only attest to things that you bore witness to but it's something that people need whenever they're part of the jury And what the jury needs to hear that the person that is being accused is innocent. They need to hear it in some facet. And defense counsel has to come up with a way to do that. So you often don't hear them say that. They can throw in, I think, feel, believe. But they have to figure out how to relay that thought, that feeling, or that belief to the jury. But here's the the catch-22. Because defense counsel should not knowingly make a false statement of fact or of law or offer false evidence to a court. It shouldn't be done through their closing argument, their opening statements, or through witnesses or even a third party. And a third party can be done through manufactured evidence. It shouldn't be done through anything other than what is actually placed before them because that even goes with me i i'm again i'm getting off subject but i'm gonna go back and it's one of those where i talk about an alibi anything you say you now have to prove you don't have to offer an alibi to anybody you don't have to participate in any police um investigation you don't you are not authorized to do it you're not obligated to do anything because at the end of the day You didn't sign up as a police officer. You didn't take their oath and you do not have a duty to the public. The only person that you owe anything to is yourself. And a lot of times we forget what ourselves is. Because most people have a very fluid idea of what family is nowadays. Because most people think it's okay to just have one parent in the house. Most people think it's okay to bring multiple strangers around children. And not understand that children learn by mimicking so they relay behaviors they relay relay languages because even myself i am very prophetic with profanity so my children have filthy mouths i'm not even going to act like they don't they all my children use profanity why because they heard old dad using profanity constantly now at the same time they also saw old dad studying They watched old dad sit down there and figure out how to make it work. These were things that they had to see. They watched me create something. They watched. So they have these images of a man doing something. They have the images of someone being as a protector. They have these images of the duties that are supposed to be done. The problem that we have as a whole when we're talking about legal defense is the only image that we have of actual legal defenses comes from television, comes from sitcoms, come from these little TV shows and Netflix. 
we don't have a real image of what can or should be done. And then we only get bits and pieces at a time of even what we should seem or what, what we would deem as correct. Because a lot of times when we're looking at this broken system, we're looking at broken methods. We're looking at other methods that are just as shady or shysty as the methods that are used in a system of absolutes that's not producing absolutions in an ethical way. But they want you to stand up and perform in ethical manners while they themselves are not being ethical. These are the things that we're challenging. These are the things that we're looking for. And these are the things that should be defended by a defense counsel. See how I tied that in together? I actually like that. That just rolled on in there. Because sometimes I take you off to the left, but I'm, I never, I hit you with a deflection. But the deflection was purposeful because, again, I'm still focused on the point. I'm still giving you food. I'm keeping you looking at the prize. Why? Because I have a direction for you. I have an end point. I know where you need to go. I know where you want to go. I know where you're supposed to go. I know how to get there. And I'm showing you how to get there through fluidity. But I'm also painting a picture. Why? Because these are things that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be able to relay a simple message to a group of people that don't give a shit about what you're talking about. They don't care to hear what you're saying. And they don't believe in anything that you're doing. Just understand that. Understand that. Don't care about what you have to say. Don't care about what you're doing. And then they don't believe you. You have to be able to relay this message to them. But you also have to be able to say, you know what? This is the light that I want to live in. This is the light that needs to be shined. And that's the thing that needs to be spread. Because that's the duty of defense counsel. And also... One of the things I often hear people do is they want to challenge jurisdiction. I even gave you a couple of of videos speaking about jurisdictional challenges. Why they can be challenged, why you're not winning, and why they are actually used and when you can use them. Now keep in mind, all of that was placed in like a total of five minutes. Because there's a method to it. And most of the people that's applying this method have no clue of what it is that they are attempting to do. Because I often tell you, while it's authorized through the 14th Amendment of the United States that the states follow behind federal law, if you're going to practice federal law, it should not be in a state court because the state doesn't practice federal law. Because the state can't give you something, so how can they take them away? But if you don't understand how to enforce federal law in state court, your issue is going to be greater. Because now, taking that, understanding certain bits and pieces, is now the application that you need to figure out. I'm going to say that one more time. Understand the application. But then, the duties of defense remain the same. Because even federal attorneys have bar cards. And with the preparation, I got a story for you. Now, whenever we were sitting up there and we were talking to Courtney during our RICO trial and Courtney was doing what she did and saying what she said, she said what she had to and did what she did. You know, she was Drake before Drake. When he was in the grassy. But Courtney actually. Did something. And. Just like water. I didn't change my strategy. I allowed it to morph. To something else. Because the application changed. Because I saw. That Courtney was being biased. I saw that Courtney. Didn't want us to win. I saw that Courtney were allowing things. That was very unlawful. So the things I did in now presenting an actual case 
actual liberty was on the line and actually relaying a message was there before me. Right then, I made a decision to make sure I covered my ass. And by doing so, I actually set or began to lay the groundwork for an appeal. I'm going to say that one more time. Once I noticed it, I had that block that was set in front of me. I realized that I had to kind of adapt to what was happening. Didn't change what I was doing. I just made note of what it was that was before me, and I became fluid like water. Because I had to go over, go around, go under, or go through what was being placed in front of me. Why? Because that was my duty as defense counsel. And by doing that, again, while my tr- strategy was adopted to what was happening, it did not change. Because I was still focused on the goal. And I want you to think about that. And when I come back from this last break, I'm going to give you a couple things. And I want you to understand these things. Because there are certain things that you're going to hear and you're not going to like. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Because these are things that you need. I'm giving you the food. And it's up to you to eat. So... Last commercial break. I'll see you guys soon. So now, this is going to be the back end of this episode. But I kind of closed right before the break with judicial bias. Now, bias of any kind is prohibited. Because at the end of the day, regardless of anybody's sex, color, creed, and all that other good stuff, we're all human. At least I would like to believe so. I know a lot of us are inhumane, but we're still human. And defense should not matter or manifest or exercise by words or conducts, bias or prejudice, based upon race, sex, religion, national origin, disability, age, sexual orientation, gender, identity, socioeconomic status. Defense counsel should strive to eliminate implicit biases and act to migrate any improper biases and prejudice when credibly informed that it exists within the scope of defense counsel's authority. Now, I get to talk about Rico. You know my cousin. So during the trial, uh, myself and my two brothers that was on trial, we were sitting up there and most people didn't know they had to, John Melvin had to run through three um, secret indictments was three um, grand jury hearings or whatever to get a true bill. And then the actual true bill wasn't a true bill because he still didn't have the number of people needed to sign off on it to make it a true bill. However, they faked the indictment. Cool. It is what it is. Then we sat through trial and they kept amending because we refused to take the deal. And the deal was 20 years per count. And the count was 13 separate incidences with at least 8 counts per those 13 incidents. And 20 years per, you do the math. Now, going through that. We were given these multiple indictments and we were supposed to sign off on them. Given indictment one, we didn't sign it. Given indictment number two, we didn't sign it. It got up to like the six or seven times. So now, understanding this this statement, the standard 4.1.6 or 4-1.6, improper bias prohibited. And I spoke about defense counsel should not manifest and should strive to eliminate implicit biases. Now, I told you I was sitting first chair because a lot of people didn't even believe that. They don't want to believe it. It doesn't matter because it happened because, unfortunately, I am that good. I'm that dude. And what happened was, my brother, when they handed it to us, we pretty much did the same thing we had did six other times prior. We just slid them past one another. Why? Because we had to inform the person that we were defending, representing, what the offer was. Now, by not signing off on it, our names was forged on it. 
that as if we had signed off on it. Now, here's the thing that, that became interesting. Because, again, this is the thing that actually allowed this to blow up. My brother looks at me and he says, he looks at the bailiff because it's passed by all three of us. And he tells the bailiff, no, what? give it here. I asked him blankly, what are you doing? Because he was known, he's known for stupid stuff. He's known for absolute, like, however, when he hits a home run, he hits it out of the park. Each and every time. He swings a lot. He misses a lot. He strikes out a lot. He is that dude. Oh, my God. When he misses, he misses bad. But when he hits one, you can go on and chalk it up. He's swinging for the fences every time. So, he signs it. He hands it to me, and he points. He writes beside his name, V. et Armis, by force of arms in Latin. And the funniest thing happened. I had an opportunity to smile during trial. And so I signed it, and my brother Alicia also signed it. We all put V. et Armis on the indictment. So what happens is now, Courtney gets it. The funniest thing about it, I had told Courtney multiple times that the person that they were indicting as me was not me. And she didn't even realize what my real name was. And in doing that, I signed my real name to the indictment. And she goes, who, where did this come from? What does Viet Armas mean? Now, keep in mind, Courtney Johnson was a judge. She was the one that was supposed to be hearing things that dealt with law. She's supposed to be well-versed in law. Viet Armas is part of law. It's part of legal terminology. It's in the legal handbook for judges. It's literally in the definition section. She had no clue what it meant. Everybody turns around and looks at me. And I, I love this. I love to tell everybody it was fold and tuck day. I would fold over one side of my jacket and I would tuck my tie down. Because every day I did something different. I don't know why it was just the stupidest thing ever. However, comma, fold and tuck day. So I folded my jacket over, dropped my tie. I look up at Miss Johnson. I said, My owner, you have been showing bias throughout this entire trial. You have forced forgeries of our names without our consent you've been practicing law from the bench you've allowed processes to go unabated I'm going to say that one more time you allowed processes to go unabated that should not have gone to that you are forcing us to be a part of something that is unlawful and I sat down The look that was on her face was the fact that the court recorder couldn't close her mouth. Everyone in the courtroom mouth was wide open. Why? Because as defense counsel, my job was to strive to eliminate implicit biases. Not only for myself, but for those that I was representing. I didn't speak for my brother I didn't speak for Alicia I didn't speak for myself I spoke for all of us because I as first chair was representing all of us I'm going to say that one more time I sitting first chair pro se represented everyone that was at the table my voice was the one that had to be able to speak above not only the former Fulton County District Attorney that was representing one of my brothers. But my other brother as well, who was also representing himself pro se. We had to have a united front. We had to have full disclosure. But we also had to have the ability to not only recognize the bias... We had to have the wherewithal and the authority to eliminate it. Now, would I have been able to do that as a bar cart carrying person? No. Because as a bar cart member, ABA member, 
my first obligation is to the court. But by not being bound by the ABA, my first obligation is to my client as a legal consultant. That is what I'm supposed to do. That is the directive that needs to be heard, and that is how it needs to be handled. Because as they as they use the words detect, investigate, or eliminate improper bias, it should be it should be stated in a manner to which it cannot be stricken from the record. Because the greatest part about that is when I said it, they could not even deny that it was happening. Because the one thing that you must do. Just just like I just said. I mean, literally. I cannot say something as defense counsel knowingly making a false statement of fact or law. But I must call out improper biases. I did that in one statement that no one could object to. That's not generally what we see. That's not generally how things are handled. And that is the problem that we have. Because when we're talking about defund this, defund that, we also need to be thinking about fight back here, fight back there. We also must understand when we're supposed to do something. Because when we're becoming engulfed in this, I always tell people, when you're talking about this, this right here that I'm looking at, this isn't, I don't play law. I'm, I'm, I'm on my De- Deontay Wilder, I don't play law. This is my life. This is a lifestyle. I'm an asshole on a level of being direct, being honest with you. I can't get, if I give you a something that's not a fact and like just some old regular BS and you my buddy type, I'm not your friend. I'm not. I don't care nothing about you. But if I'm being straightforward with you. If I'm helping you handle your business, if I'm sending you with a directive of this is what should happen. Matter of fact, if if I tell you it's going to rain, you take an umbrella. That's all you need to understand. If if I say it's going to rain, you go get your umbrella. Get Get your rain boots. Get you some galoshes. Do what you need to do. Because I'm giving you statements of fact or of law. Because a lot of times I've actually noticed that a lot of my friends don't share stuff with me on Facebook anymore which I appreciate because I, I send out a message if you're not sharing my stuff don't share anybody else's with me because this is how I get paid but also if you're going to share something after Mark Zuckerberg stated that 96% of everything that's on Facebook is a lie it is not factual it is not something that is true and then you share it with me or you make a comment to me about it I'm going to come back with facts. And if you continue to argue, you're not arguing with me. I don't care. I'm not emotional about it. Because the law is not emotional. Because I can actually show you. Just like I told the cop. I can show you in your book where you have to do this. I don't need anything special. I don't need, oh, you got it off the internet. Here's the great part. Is it wrong? Because I can go also to a law library. I can go to UTEP. I can go to the University of Louisville. I can go down there to the U. I can go to the Ohio State. I can go to Baylor. I can go to TCU. Since I'm in Texas, I got to shout out my team. I can go to the University of Texas. I can go anywhere in the country that has a law library and show you what I'm talking about. We can walk into police departments and I can show you your procedures. I can show it to you. Because whether you follow them or not, whether you're trained on them or not, they're there. There's not much variation from, you know, police department to police department. Because what I have to instill on people is the fact that law doesn't change from state to state. Law is federal. Because I've even shown you, if state, quote unquote, statutes, codes, and ordinances do not align with federal statutes, codes, and ordinances and Supreme Court cases, they're not law. That's why tent, I even gave you a case about tent. Tent isn't illegal. 
It's a safety issue. Even me and Derek spoke about it. Dexter, excuse me. Got to give Dex his props because Dex always holds me to a higher standard, and I appreciate it. But Dex even put up, speeding is a safety issue. A safety issue is not law. But it also is something that reinforces the fiduciary duty of those that are in government. Their duty is for the benefit of the public. That's why you have officer discretion. Boy, don't get me to teaching in here. Don't get me to do it. Because that's what I do. Because again, when I start illustrating one thing, it just goes right back to something I said a year ago, two years ago, six months ago, a week ago. It goes right back to the same thing. Why? Because it doesn't change. Because you can play the videos that I had two years ago. I'm saying the exact same thing now. The only difference is I'm saying it better and it looks better. That's it. I have better equipment now. I, I'm i more comfortable in front of the camera now. I have a voice that's a little bit more powerful, a little bit, a little bit less squeaky now. I'm allowing a little bit more passion in now. That's the only difference. The words are the same. The passion is different. The look is different. The quality is different. That's it. The actual impact of what I'm giving you is the exact same. The only thing is I'm better able. I've gotten a little better with my paintbrush. I'm going to say that one. I've gotten a little better with my paintbrush. And that is why I appreciate guys like Dexter. Because it allows me to become sharper. Because iron sharpens iron. When I get these calls from these judges. It allows me to be directed in the right way. When I get these calls from these law firms and these attorneys, it allows me to see the pictures as it is. Because when I, when I talked about the matrix, often I use the first matrix when I'm speaking about it. Because it's not the spoon. You cannot bend the spoon. You cannot bend state law. That's impossible. Because you're not in legis- legislation. And then the legislation is not for the benefit of the masses because it's for the generation of revenue. That's it. You're going to try to cut off the generation of revenue? Not going to happen. The bend the spoon is impossible. You must first bend your mind. That's the first thing that you need to do. That is the first thing I talk about. That is the thing that allows you to go to somewhere else because what you're doing is now training your mind for what you would perceive as the impossible. Because it's not something that's usual. It's not something that's normal. It's not something that is seen very often. It is almost, also, uh, it is almost like seeing a unicorn. And in some cases, it's like seeing a unicorn being ridden by a leprechaun with a pot of gold chasing Bigfoot. Because these are the things that I'm saying which makes people... It be, makes them come unglued because they'll just say the most wild stuff. Even when I show you someone saying or reinforcing the shit that I'm saying, it becomes hard to digest because it's just like they tell you don't you don't want to meet your heroes because it's always going to be a letdown because you have an idea what something is supposed to be. You have an idea what something is supposed to do. The fact is the fear, the false expectation appearing real when you actually become a part of it. That thing that I feared the most has come upon me when that happens. What is it that you do when you get knocked down? Do you get up? What happens? Do you get up? Do you continue the fight? Or do you forever fold? You got to keep asking yourself that question. Do you continue to fight? Or do you forever fold? Because you have to ask that question. You have to look the devil in the eye. You have to be willing to go to the mat. You have to be willing to do something that scares you to death. In order for you to live. You have to be willing to go that extra mile to be willing to get in there, get dirt, stand up, throw down, and die for this. Because if we must die, let us die nobly. Because most of us have no fear of failure. Our greatest fear is our light. It's not our darkness that um, we're most afraid of. It is our light. Because when we shine, we allow others to shine with us the problem is everybody wants to view the world in a negative light everybody wants to view the u.s in a negative light the problem is i've been to the mountaintop and i've seen the other side and it's called el paso el paso is the land of a bubble 
the things that I've seen in El Paso, the experiences that I've had in Dallas, the encounters I've been a part of here in Houston. The world is very different now. The things that I see around me are very different now. Because I walk like it. I talk like it. My back against the wall, I fought like it. I want you to understand that the mindset is the first thing. Because I always talk about everybody when, when we're having these conversations. Because that's what this is. I hope, I hope, I hope you're getting this. This is a conversation. And it's understanding. When we're sitting here and we're having these open mind discussions. Although I can't hear you talking back to me. I know you're there. I appreciate it. I want you to think about something. I want you to think about what it is that you want. What's the thing that makes you smile? What's the thing that gets you up every day? What is it? Do you accept life as it is or are you looking for an improvement? Are you looking for something greater than you? Are you looking for something positive or are you looking for at what's broken? Because either way, you're going to find it. I look at the brokenness of the system and I find purpose. I find meaning in wins. I find joy in understanding that I help someone win. I look at how whenever I'm sitting down and I think one of the most joyous things that I, I experience most days now is when I tell somebody, yeah, go ahead and give me give me a contact, call me. Well, here's my email. Shoot me an email, shoot me a phone number. And they go, oh, my God, you honestly call. And I'll, I always think, it's just you two. Like, are you serious? Like, uh, what, what, are you, what are you thinking at? Why? Why? Why is this an awe? moment why is it that you're looking at me why is it that you feel that what i'm doing is great because here's here's the thing i tell everybody my low my low self-esteem is at an all-time high just understanding that while i can't see the world through your eyes i'm looking at something else that's far beyond me i'm doing what makes me happy I'm putting together something that will live beyond me. It won't only live on YouTube. It won't only live on the internet. It will be something that will be forever cherished. But the information will outlive me. When I'm long gone, the information is still going to be here. It's going to have an opportunity to be put forth before somebody. There's going to have to be something that you want it's going to have to be something that gives you purpose because not that i don't don't appreciate people it's i try to figure out the why and for me to save my life is i I can't figure out the why because i don't feel like a celebrity i don't feel like i should be you know one of those people that people go, oh my God, that's him. That's that dude. You know, I appreciate it. I really do. And even my own boy that that ran up to me in Hartsville Airport asking for an autograph and taking pictures of Instagram. I, yeah, I appreciate you too. But to, to, to me, that was just odd. Because I'm like, why? I, couldn't, I can't figure out the why. But that's where I think everyone should live at. Figuring out the why. What it is that makes this the way it is? Why does this make me upset? What's the purpose of it? Why was it set up? Why is it giving me something that I'm not looking for? Why is it asking for something that I'm unwilling to give? Why? Because if we don't understand what somebody that represents us is supposed to do, how can we hold them accountable for the things that they are doing? How can we hold them accountable for things that they are not doing? Because even ineffectiveness of counsel is not only detrimental to the person that they're representing, but it actually is detrimental to the system itself. It shows a lack of care. It shows a level of arrogance. It shows that they don't even respect themselves nor the system. 
because the system itself is adversarial. No matter which side you're on it, you're on a side. The actual core of what is supposed to happen, if it's not done, is disrespectful. I've seen people lose their lives for disrespect. And yeah, I said that way, oh, ghetto as hell. But I want you to understand, if you're willing to kill somebody over words, why don't you have that same energy when it comes to your life? Sometimes the pause isn't even for dramatic effect. It's for effect. Because if we're going to get upset by the words someone say, why aren't we still holding people accountable for the things that they are saying or the things they aren't saying or the things that they are doing or the things they are not doing? But the real big thing is because one of the things I hate, because I'm actually getting ready to close this up today. One of the things I hate, are the arrogant bastards that sit up here and tell people, oh, go back where you come from. Because generally it's some ignorant bastard that's broke as hell that lacks education. Now, I'm, I'm going to throw something out there. Because the reason I'm saying this is because I'm, I'm referencing a couple of actual recent incidents. In doing that, there are several opportunities that are left out here in these United States. One of those opportunities is the opportunity for education. Most of us don't take advantage of the free opportunities we have for education. Because just like I talked about, the library has been open for a long time. The ability to go onto college campuses and go to the law library has been open for a long time. The availability of college classes, even for those that did not graduate properly but have GEDs or other effects from free education, are there. Many of us don't take advantage of them. In the country to which taking advantage of the system itself is one of the actual constructs of the system. So when someone that has the not only ability, the wherewithal, but also the access to information, and they don't utilize it. The access to education, and they don't utilize it. The access to opportunity, and they don't utilize it. And they're screaming something as ignorant as go back to where you come from. That is not disrespect to the person you're talking to. That's disrespect to the place that you're living in, saying that you represent. Because when we're celebra celebrating mediocrity, because that's exactly what we do often, more often than not, we're saying it's okay to remain ignorant. We're praising ignorance. We're publicly glorifying ignorance. We're showing these things and then we're sharing the same levels of ignorance. But things that benefit us, things that allow us to take advantage of not only information or even take opportunities for access to that next level, we don't even want to talk about them. That's not being shared. I even talk to people and I ask, are you sharing my videos? Are you sharing them? Which videos are you sharing? Where are you sharing them at? If the information is worth it, give it to somebody else. Because the information is free. I don't charge for this. But you'll share a video of someone being slaughtered, having your head cut off. Like, oh my God. But that, that is the most barbaric thing I've ever seen. But you're shared. Somebody fighting for no reason. You're sure of that. But something that'll free your soul. You won't share that. Just like I was getting ready to get into earlier and I didn't. People have the conversation with me a lot about good and evil. God and the devil. And I often tell them what most people miss. The one thing that most people miss is the opportunity of good and evil isn't for the soul. The soul is the end result. 
However, is the argument, the fight, the conversation is not for the soul. It's for one's decision making ability. The trade off is the soul. Because if you're deciding to do things the right way, if you're deciding to do things the wrong way, they're going after your ability to think. They're going after your mind. That's why they send out all the propaganda on Facebook. That's why Facebook is the most used app on the planet right now. Because they're giving you access to 96% of incorrect information. Why? Because they're warping your mindset. They're winning the battle for your mind. That's why if you look at, I tell people, if you have a timeline, and here's the easy. If you look at your timeline and it's full of ratchetness, it's full of desperate foolishness, if it's full of hate, if it's full of of a whole bunch of negative it's a reflection of who you are because it's showing you what you look at the most and I crack up by it because my timeline has three things on it chicks with big booties because that's what I like I like big booties it has audio and video equipment and social media content creations why? because that's what I'm doing and third It has my friends that are building businesses. Because that's who I actually communicate with. Everything else, I don't get. But I also, like I said, I get the occasional political thing because it's one of these friends that I communicate with that's sending me something and they're looking for my opinion, which I don't give opinion. I give them what the facts are. So understand, Facebook is showing you what... In your mind. And what a mind is placed on the most often. That's what you should expect. If your world is gloomy. Look at what you're inputting. Because. Food is the only thing being ingested. When you're sitting up there. The windows to your soul are. Through your eyes. Your ocular. These are the things that. Are most impactful to you. Those are the things that are feeding. Not only your soul. But they're feeding your mind. They're feeding your vision of the world. They're feeding you on how you interpret situations. These are the things that I try to give you. I I don't give you the pat on the back and, oh, you're doing a great job. If you're not doing a great job. That is, again, when I, I don't use the word friends loosely. I don't even use the word friends in mixed company because if you're not my friend, you're not access to everything. That's why I have tears. Because just like I have tears, this is the free tier. You get the free me right here. This is what you get. Because those that actually are my friends that I care about, those are the VIPs. Those are the ones that I give you the raw, uncut, the dirty, the full insight. That's Just like I tell you, they the ones that know where the bodies are buried. Why? Because now we have um, client attorney confidentiality but no seriously when we're talking about this understand you have to protect your mind just as well as you do anything else and stop worrying about what the outside world is thinking because as long as you're doing right by you making you happy and you're not harming anybody else continue living your life the way that you feel is necessary because everything that you do should be put and they smile on your face, and you should be a blessing to everyone around you because everything you touch should grow. Notice I put the word should. I do realize I used the last 20 minutes to not talk about the one thing that was actually supposed to be the topic. But I also want to make sure that I give you something. You know, I, This will be the second side. I'm giving you an alternative food source. I guess this is for the grass people, the vegans. This, I, yeah, this is my vegan um, portion of the podcast. Give you some rice and beans. You know, make sure you still get full because the beans are protein. But no, I actually want to make sure that the understanding comes with whatever I'm doing. 
I'll actually someday get back to this because this is important. But giving you the basics, the foundations of things, and also painting that picture for you. Using illustration of what should happen, how it can happen, and how it can be a blessing for you. These are the things that I feel a necessity to do. This is what I want you to understand. And if you take nothing else away from today, I want you to understand this. There's a process to everything that you're doing. Everything that you do is line by line, precept upon precept. That could not have been preached more to me on a daily basis than during my trial. That is also the one reason that I was able to stand up and throw down and was ready to die for this. It wasn't for the lack of fear. I was scared out of my mind. But when it was time to perform, I did what I do. And as I stand up, I look the devil in his eye and I bite down on my mouthpiece because it's time to go. This is go time. Because you only get one opportunity when the light's on. And I'm going to close with, with a basketball analogy. Vince Carter. Vince Carter wasn't like a super, super, I guess, player. He just he was just half man, half amazing. Why? Because he could fly through the air and he could just do what he wanted to do. At the University of North Carolina, Vince did a dunk against the University of Virginia that I didn't think was actually possible, and it was the craziest dunk I had ever seen from a vertical that did not count. He went on to the NBA. Vince went to the had an opportunity to go to the finals. He made a choice. He had one time, Game 7, Eastern Conference Finals against Allen Iverson and the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, Philadelphia 76ers. Vince had one time, one opportunity. Vince made a decision that was detrimental not only to him, but it was detrimental to his teammates. Vince went out and performed, but they lost the game. Vince never had another opportunity to do that again. When the light's on, that's when you have to perform. Because you don't know if they can ever come back on again. Allen Iverson took that opportunity with the lights on. He shocked the world by beating the undefeated Lakers through that period of the playoffs. In game one in L.A. He performed when the lights was on. Allen Iverson never got another opportunity to turn those lights on. But he did everything he could while he was there with the lights on. The question for you is, are you going to take the shot with the lights on? Are you going to be willing to stand there and look the devil in the eye and perform? Or are you going to do things that are detrimental not only to you, but to your wife, your husband, your kids, (laughs) your other family members, your brothers, your sisters, your mom and your cousins? your daddy, your grandparents, are you going to take that shot or are you going to make the decision that's going to be detrimental? And yes, that pause was for dramatic effect because you have to make a decision because everything that I'm giving you is to offer you an opportunity to change your mindset on how the world is viewed I want to change your mindset to understand how it is and what you need to do to practice and perform in a manner to win when you're standing up in front of the devil. When you go through that lake of piranha, show you how to wade in the water and not get wet. I'm going to show you how great I am because I'm going to transfer my greatness to you. That's all I got for today. I love you guys. Continue to support the podcast. Become a monthly donor of 99 cents, 4.99 or 9.99. Join the channel, one of the four tiers you awfully fit in and become a part of the Supreme Society. Do not forget to grab one of the Supreme wares, the t-shirt, the OG, the original. Grab that, they're $25 a day, plus shipping and handling, 
And I want you guys to know, those that become VIP members and become part of the Supreme Society for $100 a month on the website, you're going to get something special. I've got a couple of things for you guys. So just know, love you guys, and the first master class goes up in two weeks. Supreme, out. I'm going to show you how great I am.